Welcome to the Education, Career, and Beyond podcast. We've combined life experience with young adult drive and ambition. Are you just starting to college plan? Did you finish your education and wonder, now what? Join us in this lively discussion about the topics you need to know to create the next stage of your life's dreams, careers, finances, education, and more. Brought to you by Voice for Heroes 501c3. Well, hello, hello, hello. Uh, this is Ed Sanderson, one of the co-hosts over here at the Education Career Beyond podcast. And I think we've got a pretty exciting show for you guys today. Sometimes I forget we're live. So <laughs> I'm always, I mean, we've been used to recording and editing and putting up. So this is live. So today it's Capri and myself. Capri, say hi to the folks out there. Hi. Hey. Amy's not going to be able to join us. Well, she, she's here. She's behind the scenes. Unfortunately, she's not feeling too well. So we're going to try to hold up her end of the bargain. But today we've got an amazing, an amazing guest for you. Uh, I want everybody to say hello to Shelly Howard. Shelly, how you doing? Outstanding. Thanks for having me. So Shelly's in the uh, college planning business, and she helps families navigate that process Shelly, I, I know you have a long and distinguished resume. Maybe just give the folks a quick overview of uh, where you come from and why you do what you do. I would love to. So College Ready was established 16 years ago when a young man sitting next to me at my son's graduation says, dude, I didn't even know that kid was smart. And he was talking about my son. And so <laughs> that, that launched College Ready because he got a full ride to Harvard and it changed his life. I've been doing it 16 years now and that young man's an orthopedic surgeon. So I do this because my why is doing well and I want others to have that opportunity. That's fantastic. So we got a lot of questions. So uh, Capri is in college. I used to help people get into college and do financial aid. So this is a, a subject near and dear to my heart. And I think maybe having a different voice will help people uh, kind of put things in perspective. And I think the very first question I have for you, because it's the one I get the most, Shelly, is when do you start planning this whole college ready thing? That was my first question. Yeah. So I went first. So what? Yeah. <laughs> You know, I, this is a very, every podcast, they want to know the answer. And I, I simply state that starting when they're young and not having it, what do you want to major in? What do you want to do? It, it was when my son was in fifth grade, when we would tour Boston, we went and toured Harvard, like you would a museum. When we were in San Diego, we went to UC San Diego. So it's just a fun conversation to have, just like all the other conversations with your young ones. But when do you really start planning is when that student is inquisitive, when they're like, okay, so what's this college thing? And why do I have to go? And why I don't like more school. Do I have to go? And when they're just starting to really bring in the intellect, which usually comes around seventh or eighth grade, is the best time to start because they haven't made any mistakes yet. So I love when they promote from eighth grade and I get to help them with their, with their first academic plan. It's brilliant because then there's no regret, no mistakes. Got it. So Capri, I stole your first question. So I'll let you uh, take a stab at the handful I've got. Maybe you can steal some of mine. Wow. Um, there's a couple of ways we could go, but I think we can stick to the topic of like getting into college right now. So you just said that you have the, you don't have the chance to make mistakes if you're starting early. Can you give us a little more about what that looks like? Absolutely. Um, we experienced it firsthand with my son. He had taken Spanish in middle school, but he was told by well-meaning friends that he should start over in high school because it's going to be too hard. And he was bored to tears in Spanish one in high school because he had already taken two years. And the valedictorian started in Spanish too. And that was the difference between valedictorian and salutatorian, which is what my son was. So one class can make the difference. That may not be a big deal to you, but for somebody who wants to go to the very best, it could be a very big deal. So they have to be taken in order and you don't want to assume or listen to well-meaning people. 
Um, also kind of on that topic of like not trying to make that one mistake, I think a lot of students kind of struggle with that academic pressure of not making any mistakes. Mm -hmm. How do you think that planning ahead kind of helps to combat that? I love that question. So many students don't want to make a mistake. And some of my worst mistakes have been my most brilliant opportunity for learning, right? I'm an entrepreneur. I've made lots of them. <laughs> so I, I think it's important that when you have a plan and you start early, you have a chance to analyze and look at if I don't do this, this will happen. If I do this, this will open up that door for opportunity. So making a mistake is not the worst thing. If you look at all of the things in front of you and, and have a plan, if you're just throwing darts at a dartboard and hoping they stick, those are the mistakes you really don't want to make. Got it. It's a very good way to look at that from a learning perspective. And like, if the more you plan, the more opportunities you can see ahead. That's great. I do want to take a go. Yeah, I, I mean, in, aligned with um, Capri's question about, you know, st in your answer, Shelly, starting early, what do you tell a parent who hasn't really gotten into it? Students are sometimes focused on the academic side in the, the social aspects or they're looking at, you know, athletics and extracurricular activities. What happens when they wake up and their kid is finishing up their junior year? and they really haven't started on that process, what do you recommend they do to kind of get caught up? Unfortunately, that happens more than I would like to talk about. Um, I just met with a family yesterday who have twins that are rising seniors, and they thought they had everything lined up until we talked, and then they panicked. Yeah. The nice thing is I can either do it gently and fun over four years, or I can fire hose it. And hopefully they're mature enough to hold on to that information. It's never too late. I could take a student with zero community service hours and create a passion project their senior year. The hard part is it's a lot harder on the family. If you do it that way, just like everything else, when you procrastinate, it's going to catch up with you. No, that's a great answer. So I, I had a note about passion projects. So yes. nice segue, Shelly. Well done. I'm just going to keep on this theme. Uh, when you say a passion product project, what does that mean? And where do you kind of get them going on that subject? It's probably one of my favorite things about what I get to do. It is my belief that if every 17 or 18 year old did 200 service hours before they graduated high school, our world would be a much better place. That's my personal opinion. I don't have too many people argue that point. <laughs> but a passion with purpose is a unique project for many reasons. I started it with my firstborn because I was concerned. He wanted to be a doctor. And I wanted to know as a mom, did he want to be a doctor for the DR in front of his name? Or did he really have a heart to serve as a doctor? And so I came up with passion with purpose. It is truly an entrepreneur's dream because I take the student's passion, their core values, their gifts, their talents, their advocacy, all of that. And then we touch on what do they want to see changed in the world? And then we create a strategy on how they will lead others to create that change. What they are doing is they're learning how to serve others and be me focused but what makes it really important is they learn, do they like people? Do they not? Do you like animals? Do they not? Do they want to sell? Do they, it, they're starting to navigate. Do I, what kind of engineer do I want to be? And so that is what gives us the passion with the purpose. So they think they're serving. So they're willing to try what they don't realize is they're really serving themselves. Very well said. So you mentioned 200 hours. Uh, that can be a little overwhelming for a young person, particularly if they don't have direction and focus. Um, is that a magic number? I mean, how do how do they what does 200 hours mean to them in terms of admissions or experience? Can you please repeat that? Unfortunately, the Wi-Fi was not working. 
Okay. So uh, I get that happen. All that happens to me all the time. So 200 hours, you mentioned that, is that like a magic number? And if you're just getting started, that seemed like that might be a little overwhelming. How do you break that down? So they get direction and focus. So what I have found is all of my students who get scholarships. So in the last two years, our students have received over 22.7 million in scholarships. So return on investment is part of my process. And I want every student to get a scholarship because I think it feels good to earn something. It is my belief that it just feels good and it helps the bottom line. 200 hours is what I'm finding is the minimum to get scholarships. And so is it a minimum to get in college? Nobody will tell you that. There's no like magic number. But I haven't seen a big scholarship come through lower than 200 hours. That's why I set that as the baseline for my students. So follow up question and Capri, I'll give it back to you. Um, when you say a big scholarship at 200 hours, I guarantee there's a parent listening to this going, uh, how big are we talking? So I know that's a very vague question with over 3000 universities and colleges. But in your by your definition, what is a big scholarship? Well, I can give you an example. I had a student uh, graduated two years ago, and I, I love her story because her passion with pro passion with purpose project was difficult. She's good at a lot of things, which makes it hard. What happened during COVID is she found her greatness. She found her passion. She found her advocacy. She got a full ride to Vanderbilt pre med. Wow, that's a big scholarship. That, that was will make a lot her. of parents happy and cry at the same exact time. Totally. <laughs> All right, Capri, I've got more questions, but I'm going to let you get a word in edgewise. Here. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, continuing on the topic of scholarship, that's such a big thing, especially for students, parents, everyone involved. When would you start looking into scholarships before the college application process, after, during, when you've already been accepted and committed. Can you give us a little timeline for that? Because I know a lot of students get burnt out along the way and trying to do all those essays can be pretty overwhelming. So the best time is when you promote from eighth grade. Everybody thinks you have to wait. You don't have to wait. There are scholarships you can start competing for as soon as you finish middle school. So that summer where you're doing nothing can be the big summer of opportunity. But beware, I wanna tell your listeners, be very careful. It's a bait and switch out there. Students are like, oh, my parents are making me do scholarships. So they just put just data dump into all of these random portals. And what they're doing is they're capturing, do you own a home? Do you own a car? Do you da, da, da? And all of a sudden your parents are getting blasted with emails about refinancing and all of these scary things. What I tell my students is we know the legit scholarships. We will find them and share them with your family. The other piece is I, I help them understand if there's no essay attached, do not do it because that is where they draw the kids in. Oh, this one's easy for a thousand dollars. And then they blah, they give them all the data. It is a dangerous world out there. Just be very careful that you don't give any personal information out, but you can start in eighth grade and start building those scholarships. I have students who have gotten a free education on independent scholarships. That's incredible. That is um, amazing. Do you have any, I guess, better resources for finding scholarships that aren't necessarily like just trying to capture your data? Yeah. So a lot of untouched scholarships come from um, parents' jobs. Mm. That for some reason, nobody looks to the HR department and they have tons of money set aside for scholarships. The other one is credit unions. There's a ton of money through credit unions. The um, Rotary Club, the Kiwanis Club, all of those organizations, the Elks Club. I, I could go on and on. Like there's so much money out there. It's ridiculous. 
In my book on chapter nine, it lists all of the different legit ones, the ones that are safe that I have vetted and 10 colleges that are tuition free. You just have to work. Wow. Um, quick nice. intermission. Can you tell us more about your book? Yeah, thank absolutely. You. So my book, the title is how to send your student to college without losing your mind or your money. <laughs> Brilliant. Yes. So that topic came up because that is what parents are most frustrated about. Yeah. It's overwhelming and expensive. So I spend 12 chapters simplifying and making it accessible and easy to find information. That's genius. And where can the listeners buy your book? Um, so you can either go to freebook.collegeReadyplan.com and get a free book. Or you can go to Amazon.com and pay for it. It's completely up to you. <laughs> yeah, I'd take a free one any day. Hmm, which one will I go with? <laughs> Let me think. It's about. only for your listeners. So if you're not listening, you don't get the free book. That's a gift. There you Ooh. go. Thanks for sharing awesome. that with our folks. Yes. We always are looking for more books and resources. That's incredible. Okay. So now going back to the scholarships, you said that um, students should only be applying to scholarships with essays. How do you make yourself stand out in a scholarship essay? I'm assuming a lot of these are pretty competitive, lots of go-getters applying for the same pot of money. So I always tell my students, put yourself in the reader's position. If they wrote the scholarship question, why do you think they... They, they wrote that question. And what do you think they're looking for? Are you that candidate? If you're not that candidate, don't waste your time. There's a scholarship out there right now, $10,000 to be a, for being a vegan. $10,000. I could be a vegan for $10,000. Just saying. Oh, so, right. But if you're not, and you know, you're a big beef eater, don't, don't do that because they'll see right through it. Right. So number one is, why are you applying? That's the first thing. If it's a good fit and you're like, yes, that's me, then tell them why it's that's you. Tell them who you are. Tell them what you've done. Tell them why you matter. That's all they want to know. Most of the time, the people giving the money, I give a nice big scholarship from College Ready. And the reason I give the money is, I, my simple question is, why would college change your life? That's it. Simple question. But what I want to know is, are they going to college because their parents are making them? Are they going because they feel like everybody else is and they have to? Or they truly believe that this could be game changing for their future? So do you see how you can just read into it three different ways? And all I want to know is, why should I give you money? That's what I want to know. And all you have to do is answer because I think college will make a big difference in my life. Incredible. Thanks for breaking that down for us. Yeah. Ed, I see your thinking face going. I know yeah. you have questions about scholarships. Well, I think another interesting question that comes up, Shelly, and uh, I'm going to go the other extreme where Capri was about starting early. You said eighth grade. What happens if a young person's already in college? Are there resources available to them to help knock down that uh, cost of attendance, tuition, whatever they can to kind of, you know, they pick their dream school. Maybe the price tag is a little higher. What can they do while they're already, if they're already in school? Wow. This is a, a fully packed one. So I'm going to just break it down a little bit. So the first thing is it's a very dangerous proposition to pick a school you can't afford without scholarships, just dangerous. It's like buying a home and then thinking, how am I gonna pay this mortgage? Probably not very wise. So picking the right college from the very beginning is the number one way to not get in that position. That is a huge, helping kids find the right college is my specialty. The most generous colleges are out there, but if you're picking based on a football team or a basketball team, that is not going to be helpful when you figure out you're in debt $300,000. Ouch. Right? So let's just say, okay, we're in college. We figured it out late. We didn't know Shelly. And now we're having that moment of what did I do? You have a couple of options. You can transfer to a less expensive school or 
you mm -hmm. can work or you can apply to independent scholarships. So there are independent scholarships for college students, again, with the caveat of be careful, but that's it. That is truly all there is left. And it, I, I do, I, I talk about it as, you know, you can pay taxes, your own taxes, or you can hire a specialist. Doing college on your own at 17 is like asking your child to buy you a home. It is very scary. They do not have the knowledge. They don't have the equipment. They don't even really understand how bad that debt's going to be and that they can't even bankrupt it. So parents, you know, it may seem easy just to go, oh, you know what? They need to grow up. It's time for them to figure it out. You would never allow them to do that, buying you a home. Please don't do that for college. They have no idea how to pick a major, let alone go into debt. And that is really important. Well, thanks for that information. Uh, I wanted to go back to a qu uh, statement that you made, Shelly, about the summer between eighth and ninth grade when they're not doing anything. And I also want to kind of connect that to the 200 plus uh, community service uh, hours that lead to a scholarship. So I kind of want to just understand, not I, I don't want to understand, but I understand it. But I want you to explain to folks how a young person can spend their summer productively so that they get where they want to go with the college or university and they get the money to help offset the ridiculous cost of university and college, uh, colleges these days. Can you break down like a little, hey, if this is your sophomore year or your junior year, a couple things they should be doing so they stay engaged, they can be productive and have a good time with their friends and family at the same time. I would love to do that. So there's seven things. I'll go through them quickly. Um, if you want more information, either read the book, hop on a webinar, go to my website, but here you go. You want to have a four-year academic plan. You don't want to pick each semester randomly. You want to have the whole strategy laid out. Number two, your test scores. They are not optional if you want scholarships. They may be optional to get in a school, but if my students are writing them in an essay that they got a perfect ACT, how is it optional? Number three, passion with purpose leads to a standout strategy. How will you stand out? Number four, leadership is critical. Colleges don't want you to come in and take a seat and leave. They want you to come and make their school better. Extracurriculars, tell them who you are, why you matter. Very important. Letters of recommendation. If you had your camera off during COVID, there is no letter of recommendation because they never got to know you. But there's always time to get your teachers to know you. And the final one is the essay. Insanely critical because somebody will always have a higher GPA and a lower GPA, a higher test score and a lower test score. So tell me who you are. And there you go. There you go. I love it. Uh, Amy put up the uh, website. So you definitely want to go check out this information. It's extraordinarily valuable. The more time you plan, the better. The more time you spend planning. I should say the better the results are going to be, which leads me to the other big question. And we touched on it a little bit earlier about college selection and sifting through that. And you said, if you're going to a school that puts you $300,000 in debt, there might've been a mistake made in the process. So I guess the families would wanna know either a student or a parent, how do we find the right school so that we have a fighting chance to get some of that money? So there's really two options. You can spend about 20 or 30 hours a week doing the research, or you hire a professional college strategist. That is it. it you, it you have more money or time. It's the old adage. It, it's one or the other. There's no sheet because everybody would be off the same sheet and then it would mess up the algorithm. But keep in mind, after 16 years of doing this and millions of dollars in scholarships, I know where the generous colleges are, right? Your CPA knows tax code where they're going to save you money. You could do your taxes or you hire somebody to save you money. That's what it all comes down to. There is no way, at least that I know, where a, uh, a family can Google it even with AI and come up with the information because I've tried it and it is not correct. 
Unfortunately, U.S. News and World Report is not a valid picture of who got mm -hmm. in last year. That is truly who applied, which is way out of whack, and who actually were admitted. So that data is not a true picture of what is actually happening. That's good information. Um, I was going to ask another question. It slipped out of my mind. Capri, did that trigger any questions, or do you have anything else on your list that you want to run by Shelly? I think we've been working together for so long that we have all the same questions today. <laughs> exactly. So Shelly, I was going to ask you a personal question about your kids. I noticed on your website, you, you said you already mentioned one went to Harvard. You got kids going a lot of different directions. Um, not only do you service and work with families, but to go through that and see the, the, the diversity and the interest of your kids, uh, I think the one thing I was going to ask related to that is that a lot? Some families think their kids are all going to do the same thing. I noticed just in school selection, your kids are kind of different and unique. Can you talk to them a little bit about how important it is to identify the personality and the scope of what the student wants to do, and how that feeds into how a college can even be selected or a group of colleges should be selected? I love that question. Nobody's ever asked me that. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> I could probably align it best because I am a, a mother of four. So, you know, first, any parents out there that are listening, if you have two of the same children, I'm shocked <laughs> because that doesn't ever happen. Even I have triplets in my in my program and they are all so different. So the first thing I would look at is who they are. What is a good fit for them? Do they want to be the big fish in the small sea or the small fish in the big sea? Socially, are they going to be happy where they want to go? If not, transferring at an extra $100,000 to the bottom line, okay? Not a good plan. My firstborn knew he wanted to go Ivy in eighth grade, and he knew he wanted to be a surgeon. He never lost sight of that. And so he did Harvard to UC San Diego Medical School to UCLA Orthopedic Surgeon. Wow. My second, she, she is a compassion, loving young lady, and her dream was to work with children. So she decided to become a registered nurse and work in the emergency room um, of the PEDS uh, department at Chalk and one of the best PEDS department. Um, and so both Kim's... Both of my own, my first two went STEM and medicine and I'm needle phobic. So ironically, either they didn't want me in their place of business or they saw I have a huge passion to serve my community. My core value is community service. So I think they saw my love for serving my community and maybe they wove it into their profession. Now my, my stepson and my stepdaughter um, are on a different path. My stepson is going to be uh, news and broadcasting and he's at oh. San Francisco state going a completely different direction. And the youngest I got to raise, she knew that he went to Harvard, she went to Alabama and he went to San Francisco state. I'm not doing that. And I want to graduate debt free. So she said, I'm going to go international business and I'm going to go to AAU in Prague in the Czech Republic. Wow. So she's getting a dual European and American degree in three and a half years for $27,000 in total. Wow. How impressive is that? So please, parents, they're not different, right? Meet them where they're at and they will end up thriving all of my kids are where they want to be and they're doing well because of it. I saw a lot of students at Harvard that my son was, you know, was part of that were not a good fit. They were drowning. They were overwhelmed. And to be honest, I wouldn't have been a good fit there. I, you know, it was intense. My son got one B all four years and he thrived there and it was perfect for him. So just watch Listen, I even videotape students walking around campus and ask my student, do you see yourself here? And that's when it got real. Yeah. Yes and no. 
So, uh, by the way, Shelly, this has been a great conversation. Thank you for sharing so much information with our audience. Uh, I always ask the same question every single guest because I think it kind of fits in our conversation. I don't know if this will resonate with you or not, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Um, in your journey, uh, was there anybody who helped guide you, a mentor, somebody who's like took you under your wing, under their wing and said, Shelly, this is what you need to know, either on the business side or on the academic side, where you look back and go, man, I wouldn't be where I'm at without them. I'm thinking. Um, College Ready is my seventh business I've started. And so I'm a serial entrepreneur. It's by far my favorite and the one that I will be at until somebody else makes a decision that I won't be. <laughs> um, there was a need. And my son is really my inspiration. He's like, mom, I, I want to do this. How? And there was nobody to help us. I went to his high school counselor and she said to him, why would you waste your time or money being a doctor? They don't make money anymore. <laughs> literally, that's the look I gave him, Capri. I was like, are you oh. kidding me right now? And so it was my son saying, mom, please help me. I don't know how to do this. And so I built him a business plan for himself to get into college. So it was really my son asking for help and then doing exactly what I recommended. He was my inspiration and he was my why. That's awesome. Yeah. Which leads me to one other question and Capri, I'll give you the floor. <laughs> um, you talked about your asking for help. Um, how important is it to for parents and students just to ask for help? I mean, this process, as you know, is a horribly complex um, kind of way. It's just difficult to navigate. It's horribly complex. So how important is ask for help, whether that's working with you individually or just in general, so they can get answers to their questions so they don't make big mistakes along the way. It's so important. And that's why I give away my book. So freebook.collegereadyplan.com for your listener is because it's the foundation of the house. I can't, give the whole house because the, it would be novels. It wouldn't be a book. And interesting enough, um, is it not coming up? It should be freebook.collegeready.com. Oh, freebook.collegeready.com. There you go. There it is. Okay. So honestly, I wrote the book because I lost a bet to my son. <laughs> you want to be straight up honest. When he left for, for Harvard, I was so, so proud of him. And he said, Mom, if I graduate without debt, you need to write a book because other people need to know how you did this. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sure, sure, sure. I, I don't like writing. I'm not my essay editor. I have a professional essay editor for my students. And when he crossed the stage, he handed me his Harvard diploma and he says, Mom, where's the book? Oh, boy. And I stopped working for three months. I took a hiatus and I wrote the book and it was a bestseller in 24 hours. Wow. Because it's the foundation of what the minimum you have to do. So if anything, I'm giving you a free book. Go get the foundation. And that way you'll know what needs to happen from there. You can either do it yourself and hopefully you, you find the right information. Like I said, I spent about 30 hours a week for four years doing this for my son on top of my full-time job. Now I do it 80 hours a week and I have a whole team. So it changes every day from test optional to test blind to fully testing. It is something you have to be in the know. I read two to three hours a day on what's the latest and greatest. So it's not something you can just decide to wing it. You can, and if they get in, they won't get out without debt. That's the risk. I like that. I think if I was going to summarize everything you just said, Shelly, it's either an investment of time or money. You better pick which one it's going to be. For sure. Yeah. All right, Capri, awesome. final questions, thoughts before we get out of here? Um. No, this is a great episode. We learned so much applying how to really stand out and apply to essays, when to really start planning earlier is better, and how you can 
just find the school that's perfect for you. Do you have any pieces of encouragement for students that are starting the college planning process just because it is super long and you've been in this business for what seems like ever and you're just so knowledgeable? I love that question. And yes, I do. What you're reading on social media is not, is not really happening. We had the best the best successful year ever. Our students got into all the top tier schools, all the UC schools. We it was phenomenal. Every one of our students hit their top three. What you're seeing on social media is the people who navigated it on their own and have a high GPA and a high test score and are shocked. So please do not get caught up in the media part and just know there are so many great colleges out there. There is opportunities for a ton of free money. I just want to inspire you. The more you put in, the more you'll get out just like anything else. But just know it is possible. And I've proven it so many times. That is so great. Thank you for joining us today. Um, where can our listeners find you? Obviously, your website is up and running. It is ready college planning, right? College ready plan. College oh, ready plan. And I have a podcast and it's parents. Is your teen college ready? So for those of you who like podcasts, I do a coffee and conversation with a lot of people that you're going to want to meet from test strategists to essay editors, everybody you want in your corner to be successful, I bring them all to you. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for joining us, Shelly. Thanks for joining us today. Um, don't forget to like, subscribe, listen to the podcast, leave us a review, and we'll see you all next week.